This video is brought to you by Guardio. We've talked a lot about The Matrix over the years, which makes sense as it's a sci-fi film dealing with the relationship between technology and capitalism, inspired by ancient Greek philosophy and 20th century French theory, and also Keanu. I know Kung Fu. And while we thought we'd said all that we needed to about the film, things are feeling a little bit different these days. So we wanted to do a quick revisit to some of the film's themes. Now, one of the Matrix's key questions, would it be better to live in an ideal simulation or a dystopian reality, is now way more poignant with advancements in technologies like AI, digital media, and Zuckerberg's life mission to make us all live in his weird beige VR world. While Neo's virtual reality was basically office space, except not funny, ours seems like it could be way better. But even with all of these advances, when asked, most people still say they'd opt for a mediocre meat life over a digital life of wonder. Now, in fairness, they're being asked this by grad students giving surveys and not dudes that look like Lawrence Fishburne with pills in their hands. But even if people say they want to remain unplugged, their actions paint a different picture. We're spending more and more time in digital and virtual spaces and way less time raw dogging reality. So do we really value authenticity over pleasure and comfort? Is VR slowly becoming better than reality? And can philosophy help us figure it all out? Let's find out in this Wisecrag edition on virtual reality. Would we all choose the matrix today? But before we get into it, I want to talk about websites. And in particular, websites that want to hurt me in particular. Now. I don't do a lot of weird stuff on the internet, but I do spend a lot of time looking for PDFs of obscure books. And occasionally I end up on a website that is more faux than friend. I think I'm downloading a hard to find book when in fact I'm downloading a piece of malware, which is why I'm glad to now be protected by Guardio a browser extension that's your own personal digital security, keeping you safe from phishing scams, malware, information leaks, dangerous downloads, and annoying and harmful pop-up ads. And it makes me feel way more relaxed and confident as I waste my life opening tabs that I'll never return to. Guardio blocks 100 times more harmful websites than its competitors and 10 times more malicious downloads than any other security tool. And to show you how well it works, I'm gonna open a link from my spam folder in my email that I know is bad. There you go. And as you see, Guardio knows. It knew this was a stupid and bad link that I shouldn't be clicking. You know, it knew that I shouldn't, so it wouldn't let me. Thank you, Guardio. Now, because you likely use way more than one device in a given day, they also have you covered across platforms. And if you've ever had to talk your mother out of getting scammed, which I have multiple times, you'll love the fact that you can use your Guardio account to cover five family members at no additional cost because, Let's be honest, who wants their already dwindling inheritance to end up in the hands of scammers? So join the more than 1 million users currently keeping their data safe and secure with Guardia. And if you use the link below, you'll get 20% off your monthly subscription. You can scan your browser for threats for free by visiting guard.io slash wisecrack. And you'll get a seven day free trial to the premium features such as real time threat removal. Again, just go to guard.io slash wisecrack or click the link in the description and check out their affordable premium plan for full protection. Seriously, do it, you'll love it. But for now, back to the show. When The Matrix premiered in 1999, its central question was, is it better to live in the machine-ruled real world or stay plugged into The Matrix, an illusory computer-generated reality? I know this steak doesn't exist. I know that when I put it in my mouth, The Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. The film's creators, the Wachowskis, were imagining everyday nine to five existence as its own type of matrix, where we blindly follow what's in front of us without asking what's really going on. In this way, it's a modern update of Plato's allegory of the cave. But as VR advances, philosophers are beginning to wonder if, as Lorenzo Biscucci puts it, perhaps the more people become familiar with virtual reality technologies, the more they could be prone to plug in. This is likely due to two interrelated factors. VR has gotten better and reality has gotten worse. When The Matrix first came out, this is what VR looked like. Best case scenario, it would feel like getting sucked into a bargain bin Nintendo 64 game, which uh, yeah, I'm not leaving behind hot showers and delicious Indian food to live in that. But now Sony, Meta, and Apple are all pushing the VR industry into spaces that actually look pretty fun and kind of good. On the flip side, the world, 
got way less fun after The Matrix came out. I walked out of that film an optimistic eighth grader who just had his first movie date. But soon after, we were all greeted with 9-11, the never-ending war on terror, the birth of social media, the 2008 financial collapse, climate disasters, the return of fascism, and a global pandemic. So yeah, things got bad. Really makes a guy just want to shove a USB cable into his butt just to see if anything cool happens. Let us know in the comments if you've ever put a USB cable in one of your holes and what happened when you did it. One of the Matrix's major themes was the idea that we should be peeking behind the curtains to try and see things for what they really are. Welcome to the desert of the real. The film pointed towards dark underlying truths and a time of cultural optimism. Now, if you don't believe that cultural optimism ever existed, please go watch some clips of MTV's TRL from 1999. There's like two girls that are like flipping us off, are just going crazy flipping us off. According to Vox writer Emily St. James, the film captured a growing sense that nothing was real and everything was manipulated on some level. A sense that has only grown in the 24 years since the movie came out. In the same essay, she argues that The Matrix is probably the most famous film out of a micro generation of movies I like to call end of history movies, after the Fukuyama book of the same name. Capitalism and liberal democracy were just the way to organize one's society, and the end of the Cold War had proved that. And if that's true, then why do these protagonists feel so dissatisfied? In other words, these films pointed to the idea that maybe the end of history and liberal democracy were built upon some shaky foundations. But this question of whether or not human beings should want to escape into a virtual realm was being discussed by philosophers long before Neo ever learned that, in fact, there is no spoon. Philosopher Robert Nozick came up with a thought experiment called The Experience Machine in his 1974 book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia. While largely meant to argue against hedonism, it offers another take on the Matrix debate. He describes it like this. Suppose there were an experience machine that would give you any experience you desired that could stimulate your brain so that you would think and feel you were writing a great novel or making a friend or reading an interesting book. All the time you would be floating in a tank with electrodes attached to your brain. Should you plug into this machine for life, pre-programming your life's experiences? You can pick and choose from their large library or smorgasbord of such experiences. And just an aside, um, I didn't watch the movie Don't Worry Darling, but from what I understand, it sounds like the plot was basically this, except it was incel bros forcing their cool girlfriends into the experiment against their will. Let me know in the comments if that's what happened, because I'm never going to watch it. While Nozick's experiment definitely sounds matrixy, it has some crucial differences. First, the virtual reality in the film isn't designed for pleasure, but to keep human brains distracted while they're hooked up to tubes fueling their robot overlords. Second, it's forced upon individuals without their consent. Busichi further explains this distinction, writing that in The Matrix, the simulation is provided by machines that enslave us for their benefit, while the experience machine is maintained by benevolent neuroscientists. This difference is important because in the matrix scenario, we understandably have an intuition for reality in favor of our human rights. I don't want to be a battery for machines, but this isn't necessarily true in Nozick's scenario, as here the virtual reality is entered into voluntarily. Busichi goes on to explain that even if the experience machine sounds preferable to the Matrix, it's still not a desirable option for most people. In one survey, 84% of the participants refused the offer. The experience machine allows us to have the best experiences we can imagine, and still, the study showed that a large majority have the intuition that the life plugged into is not a good life. This means that for many people, there must be something, perhaps reality itself, that is valuable in addition to the feels of experiences, just as Nozick himself. But in lots of small ways, we're heading towards a more digital existence every day. Filters on apps like TikTok can alter our physical appearance in real time. Others spend much of their lives on Twitch or other streaming platforms. And everything from education to sex work is increasingly shifting to digital spaces. And that's to say nothing of Zuckerberg's promise to have have a full-scale metaverse up and running in the very near future. It's seemingly more of a death by a thousand cuts situation than a samurai sword to our analog existence. 
So are the survey results indicating that we don't want to jump into an experience machine misleading? Are we lying to ourselves about our desire to keep it real? Busici notes that Adam J. Culver advanced the idea that Nozick's thought experiment might be deceiving because of the status quo bias, a phenomenon well-established in psychology, according to which people tend to irrationally prefer to leave things as they are. And this seems to make sense based on, I don't know, living life and constantly not changing things that I know I should change because it's more comfortable to just stay in the status quo, even if I'll regret it all on my deathbed. Is that just me? Well, then, then delete that part. But Nozick commits to the idea that saying no to the experience machine is not only the option most people will take, but that it's the option most people should take. He offers three reasons for this. First, we want to do certain things and not just have the experience of doing them. A second reason for not plugging in is that we want to be a certain way, to be a certain sort of person. Someone floating in a tank is an indeterminate blob. Plugging into the machine is a kind of suicide. Thirdly, Plugging into an experience machine limits us to a man-made reality, to a world no deeper or more important than that which people can construct. There is no actual contact with any deeper reality, though the experience of it can be simulated. As we said before, Nozick invented this experiment to criticize hedonism, which is the idea that happiness boils down to pursuing pleasure above all else. And while less overt, The Matrix also offers a critique of pursuing pleasure via mindless consumerism. In both cases, if hedonism was the motivating ethical factor for most people, then they would likely want to plug into machines that let them have cyber sex with their celebrity crush, drive F1 cars while drinking champagne, or have their dad tell them, good job, Michael. I love you. But Nozick's thought experiment highlights that humans value lived reality over pleasurable mental experiences, or at least they claim to. Author Ray Bradbury offers a similar take in The Happiness Machine, a story that inspired Nozick's thought experiment. In the story, a husband builds a machine aiming to make people happy, even though his wife feels like this project is making their home life miserable. She tries the machine for herself, going dancing in Paris, but the initial joy backfires. She laments, Why well, you got me thinking, Paris. So suddenly I want to be in Paris and I'm not. You had me dancing. Well, I haven't danced in years. Also, if any of you have been married for 20 years and you haven't danced with your partner in that long, why not now? You know, why not today? Make today the day that you dance again. It's sort of like if you fly coach and then one day you randomly get upgraded to first class and the next time you fly coach, it feels like you are in an airborne prison. Now, the woman's husband later asks, should happiness, he wondered, be something you can carry in your pocket? Or he went on, should it be something that carries you in its pocket? And while Bradbury wrote that story in 1957, it's now the case that we do carry little virtual happiness machines, or for some of us, anxiety machines in our pockets. And the idea of our smartphones being their own sort of little happiness machine leads us to reconsider the question posed by both the Wachowskis and Nozick. Because it wasn't really a question when The Matrix first came out, as there wasn't really that much digital reality to escape into. But today, there are whole subcultures, and even whole worlds, that exist on digital servers that are accessible to anyone with an internet connection. And it seems like rather than some all or nothing decision to choose the blue pill, we've made a lot of little decisions over the last 24 years that have allowed us to slowly make our existence more and more digital. In that way, we're already living in our own sort of matrix or experience machine, but it's just a lot more boring than what we've seen in the movies. And it's also one that is heavily monitored with our data being used as fuel for massive corporations. While it's not tubes literally sucking our lives away, it is an entire digital ecosystem that uses our time, money, and attention as resources. Now, while films present the end of the world as one quick apocalyptic event, it's recently been pointed out by writers like Mark O'Connell that we're already living in the end of the world. It's just a lot more slow and boring than the movies led us to believe. In a similar way, our transition to a virtual existence is already happening. It's just a lot more boring and funded by a lot more multinational corporations than The Matrix would have had us expect.
But what do you all think? Is there something irreducibly special about the real world? Would we rather struggle here than thrive in VR? Or do 24 year old sci-fi movies and even older philosophical thought experiments fail to speak to our current reality? Please let us know what you think in the comments. A special shout out to all of our patrons who make up our own sort of virtual community and hang out on our Discord server and enjoy our extra content. If you wanna join this community, there's a link in the description. And thank you so much to all of you for hanging out with us, letting us ask some big questions and you know, humoring us along the way. We also really appreciate your likes, your subscriptions, your comments, it's the best. But for now, have a good one. I'll catch you next time.